from the Kingdom of Ohio. You are listening to the O'Culture Podcast. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. You will not find too many people who work in and around paranormalia like our guest this time around. His name is Joshua Cutchin, and he's the author of the recently released Thieves in the Night, a brief history of supernatural child abductions. Thieves in the Night deals with complex and delicate issues pertaining to human sexuality, reproduction, mental health, and gender, with a particular focus on the fairy faith and the parallels to UFO and extraterrestrial abduction experiences. And as Josh himself notes in his intro to the book, this should be treated as a thought experiment and launching point for further discussion and debate of the paranormal, rather than objective truth, which is an approach I can absolutely get down with. And get down with that approach Josh and I most definitely did. So enough prologue, let's flip the script to dialogue and welcome Mr. Joshua Cutchin into the house. Enjoy. Joshua Cutchin, thanks for being here, man. I hope you brought your tuba. <laughs> no, not not today. I, I've been playing way too much tuba to to, to play tuba today. <laughs> it's like you know, it's yeah. it's Mardi Gras and Oktoberfest. Those are the two times of year when, as a tuba player, you're you're busiest. So we're just sort yeah, of rounding out the, uh, the ladder here. The uh, the veil thins and all the tubas come out. <laughs> oh, the horror. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, yeah. So, you know, I don't want to know how you got started as a tubist. I want to know, how does one stay a tubist? Because it seems like a tough gig. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. You know, it's kind of funny. I never really would have expected, you know, I, I did the uh, did the classical training route, which I think is really, if you really want to excel on your instrument or, you know, with voice or something, I think classical training is a great thing to do. Going through the conservatory model, that's, that's a great, great uh, way to really sort of own your skills. But, you know... I, I, I just assumed that if I was going to be playing tuba, it would be, you know, in some sort of classical capacity, like a brass quintet or for some sort of chamber group or for a symphony. And that's really what I was I was geared toward for the longest time. And then I ended up getting a journalism master's. That's sort of a longer story that we won't get into. But I ended up having a day job. And in 2015, I said, this sucks. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, um, so, it, it does suck. Yeah, um, it was I was working for the School of Music at the University of Georgia, and it was it was basically had I had sixty bosses who were all you know musically inclined artists, so you can imagine how frustrating that could be. You know, everybody thinks that their thing is the most important. There are some good guys and some good good ladies in there too, but it was just too much stress for the you know for the uh, for the amount of money I was getting paid. So I left and wrote a book on the paranormal and really started focusing. I mean, I, I focused a little bit on you know doing jazz and classical styles, but really doubled down on that and uh you know right now this past you know past two months i've you know there i've had at least three gigs every every weekend you know in addition to teaching and and uh doing clinics and master classes at different schools and it's 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 so i guess i guess the 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 short answer is you know learn to improvise that's how you stay employed as a tuba player (laughs) you know i never i never really thought i would take this route but here i am and if somebody offered me a um a jazz gig or a classical gig i'd take the jazz gig any day because i just found it a lot more rewarding to make stuff not make stuff up but you know make stuff up within certain parameters as i go it's exciting that's for sure definitely yeah i can get down with some jazz for sure hey but you mentioned your book on the paranormal you know let's talk about your two previous books just briefly they're called a trojan feast the food and drink offerings of aliens fairies and sasquatch and the brimstone deceit an in-depth examination of supernatural sense otherworldly odors and monstrous miasma Obviously, we haven't discussed those here before. It's the first time we've chatted. But tell the people a bit about them and then also what sort of parallels they may have with your most recent book, Thieves in the Night. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so, you know, my paranormal origin story isn't nearly as exciting as anyone else's. I've always been, I'd always been interested in Fortiana. Was more interested in the cryptozoological aspect than the ufological aspect. But for some reason, there was always something in the back of my mind that I always found interesting about, you know, the fairy folk. And... uh I remember I had gotten a, an Amazon gift card from my sister-in-law for my birthday, and I ended up buying a Bigfoot book because, again, that was the main thing was like, you know, Bigfoot and cryptozoology. And I remembered reading um, a passage in there about uh, some First Nations tribes from Alaska who felt that if you took food from the Bookwis, which was one of their sort of Sasquatch analogs, 
you would actually remain trapped with the book list forever in the spirit world. And, you know, that's that's one aspect of the fairy folklore that had always, you know, gotten stuck in the back of my head a long time ago. And I said, huh, that's funny. Somebody should write a book about that sometime. <laughs> and, you know, I sort of sat on that that idea percolated for about two months. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to do this, which is, you know, it's sort of an intimidating thing to do to put your name out there and have your name attached with these sort of subjects. You have no idea. You have no idea how people, you know, how normies are going <laughs> to accept that. You know, every every now and then I'm, I'm astonished to find out how many uh how many band directors and parents of my my students have not Googled me and, and seen that I'm, I'm contacted, to, I'm connected to all this stuff, rather. But uh, <laughs> So I ended up writing this book on, basically, it's, it's expressions of the food taboo in paranormal lore, but also just food and drink offerings in general in the paranormal, which is, it was, you know, I, I, I hope this doesn't sound too braggadocious, but it really was the first time anybody had ever, had ever really looked at that. And, and from then, I, 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 you know, I said to myself, that's, I really think that's what people need. They don't need another book about Roswell or about, you know, all these other subjects that have been covered ad nauseum. We really need people looking at these tiny subjects that seem to be unimportant, but actually might yield some relevant data to these topics as a whole. And it was, uh, it was, it was, that was, the, that, was the, that was my first start. So it was, I, I'm incredibly humbled to say that it was, it was well received by people, you know, uh, uh, people that I, whose books I read, Growing up, like Jerry Clark and, uh, you know, Nick Redfern coming out and saying really kind words about my book. I mean, that's I can't I can't have asked for a, for a for a more welcome reception. So that was really humbling. And then, and of course, then where do you go from there? You know, you've, you've done something that no one's <laughs> talked about. Where do you go from there? So I'd always found interesting the similarities of smells, certain smells and how they cropped up in the paranormal. And people had, you know, written paragraphs here and there on that sort of topic. But uh, no one had ever really done a deep dive, especially taking a look at it with, you know, some some actual olfactory science and, you know, taking a look at the chemical composition of these odors and seeing if there was perhaps some sort of information we can glean about the paranormal from that. So uh, I wrote uh, in 2016. So 2015 was a Trojan Feast. 2016 was the Brimstone Deceit, which is, it sounds, <laughs> I love the title and I hate the title because as I've said on other podcasts, it sort of sounds like an evangelical book or something, right? <laughs> the Brimstone yeah. Deceit, like <laughs> yeah. a Joel Austin <laughs> novel. But it's not, um, you know, the the odor of sulfur does play a huge role, but it doesn't go down a demoniacal angle. And also, I mean, there's a ton of other odors that uh, that you find in the paranormal as well that really crop up time and again, like the smell of ozone, um, certain de decompositional smells. And really just that book tries to find the links between these smells and what they sort of all mean and could mean. And, you know, if there's some sort of uh, shared connection between all these phenomena, because I, I think we really do underappreciate how connected a lot of what we would call paranormal topics are. I think the worst thing that, that can happen in these subjects is for us to silo them off. You know, so the cryptozoologists think the ufolo ufo ufologists are crazy and the ghost hunters think the Bigfoot people are crazy. It's just, it's silly because we're all living in glass houses here. <laughs> you know, we're all, to, to, to the normies out there, we're all crazy. And uh, so I, th those were the two, um, my first two books. Um, in 2017, I contributed an essay to Robbie Graham's collection of UFO, UFO essays. UFO. What am I, 1950s NICAP? UFO, <laughs> UFO essays. UFOs reframing the debate. And uh, then this this year, I published an essay in David Weatherly's Woodnox Volume 3 on Bigfoot, and then uh, my latest book, which is uh, Thieves in the Night, which looks specifically at uh, at paranormal child abduction. And so, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big fan and, uh, I guess acquaintance friend, uh, maybe I, I, I'd, I'd feel honored to call myself a friend of, of Gordon White. And Gordon talks about how, you know, Gordon has released three separate books and he talks about how they sort of coalesce into a fourth secret book. And I feel like if, if you read all three of my books, you sort of get an idea. There, there's a different picture emerges than just reading one or, or two of them. Uh, and I really do think that is sort of this unspoken thing. So there's some connective tissue that you can read between the lines in each of these, in each of these books, if you're informed by the other two. Yeah, I have to say though, I, I've been a fan of your work obviously for a couple of years now since I first discovered it. So it's really nice to have you here. But I do want to ask you. So I had a chat very recently with uh, Peter Biebergall. He's put out a new book uh, called Strange Frequencies: The Extraordinary Story of the Technological Quest for the Supernatural. Recommended if you're into the paranormal, for sure. But he makes <clears> a direct <throat> distinction between the meaning of paranormal and supernatural. He separates these two words and says that they, they mean two different things. I don't know if you heard that chat, but the gist was 
You know, he wasn't using them interchangeably, like I said, and I thought it was both an interesting and a valid distinction. His his uh, idea of the paranormal was more related to psi abilities, and the supernatural were sort of like um, the entities that you would interact with, with magic or your psi abilities or whatever else. So that's a very poor explanation of it, but I'd like to ask your thoughts on this, because you did use those terms interchangeably in your book. Do you have any thoughts on what those words actually mean or represent, or is this just maybe unnecessary semantics? That's an excellent question. You know, I've in, in general, I have used them interchangeably because to me, it, it almost becomes a point where, well, the, the real question is, at what point does common use trump a perhaps different interpretation of these two terms? In other words, what I mean is if people, if the public at large uses these terms interchangeably, then what, how does it serve us not using them interchangeably? You know, I think when you really sort of parse out the etymology of those words, both of them mean outside the regular. So I, I, I t- that's one of the reasons that I have tended to use them interchangeably. I've got to go back and listen to this conversation now because I've kind of felt in general that it's been sort of quaint to distinguish between the two. But, you know, honestly, both terms I am not really that fond of. I, I think it would be much more parsimonious to move to a term that's more akin to, you know, paramaterial or supermaterial, because that's really what we're dealing with. You know, you you run into these people who say, I don't believe anything supernatural because it'll all be proven to be natural, right? And I mean, yes, in a sense, but if we're still in the materialist paradigm, then then no, that that won't that won't happen. You know, I, I don't I don't I, I'm a firm believer that that's that that's not the case. So I do tend to use the the, the two interchangeably, and I haven't, I guess, sufficiently researched the logic behind both. I I can see why someone would have a personal standard for not using them interchangeably, but like, whenever people get up in arms about people using them interchangeably, I think that's sort of a, unless you've explained your standpoint, I I think that's uh, that's a little bit too confrontational for me, I guess, is when people, because I've I've seen some people on Twitter saying, you know, just basically talking in general about their frustration with people using them interchangeably. Well, I mean, you know, go out and evangelize and talk about how that's different. But at the end of the day, you know, if you look at a lot of these subjects and a lot of these topics, if there is something in, you know, as as he was using paranormal, you know, if, in terms of paranormal meaning psi phenomena, that really is the only thing that needs to happen in terms of a the first domino falling for nothing to be natural in the sense that we understand, because that that really does undermine that materialist construct. Yeah, it's. I, I just wanted your take on that because, you know, I don't like the word paranormal either. I don't mind supernatural so much, but I'm not really sure what it means either. So I was just thought it was interesting that, and he, well, he had broken up occult too. He had defined those three words for the purpose of his book. And I thought, well, you know, that's a good thing to ask Josh about because you well, are, I think, at heart, a skeptic. I know you don't like those words either, just from previous conversations I've heard. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, my, my real question that I would be is if if we use paranormal abilities... So, in other words, consciousness effects to interact with supernatural entities. I mean, at, at what point are we just like you said? At what point is this a semantics game? If if they're, if the two are so so intrinsically tied together, how do you even you know separate those two out? I do think that there's room for. I I do get a little bit upset when people talk about things that are more likely to be to have a natural explanation as as being paranormal or supernatural. I do think that describing spirits in terms of being supernatural might be, you know, I, I had to give that some more thought. I had to give that some more thought. Yeah, that's all we're doing here, man. It's just a big thought experiment, you know, <laughs> just kind of like, yeah. I think your book, I think you said that about your book too up front. You were like, this is just a thought experiment. So I'm down with that. And Josh, I like to take questions that authors pose in their books and pose them back to them, especially ones that, you know, are sort of answered by the rest of the book, you know, maybe not like specifically or directly. Let's ask a big question here. Are children, for whatever reason, more prone to paranormal activity? I mean, I think so. I I, I feel like, well, okay, so it's, you have to look at whether or not child testimony is reputable. And there's a little bit of a section in the book where I talk about that. And I think that, I think that some of the things that we think were childhood fancy or fantasy in our youth weren't. And I think that some of the things that we think weren't were. The question is how that really that really blends and, and sort of overlaps. If you look at really traditions all the world over, they tend to contend that being children, you sort of have 
it's almost as if you're not fully removed from the spirit world yet. And there does seem to be some correlations between youth and, you know, the ease of remembering past life memories. Obviously, you know, a lot of these, you know, the, the book talking about encounters with uh, the supernatural and well, <laughs> now I'm self-conscious about using that word <laughs> encounters with, with non-human <laughs> Sorry, man. intelligences. Sorry. Encounters with non-human intelligences. I mean, it, it's, it's difficult to say because it's also become sort of a sci-fi horror trope, right? But at the same time, I think that trope does have some, some, some genuine roots in, in sort of a, an unexplained reality. I think that, there is an openness and an unquestioning and a frankness, perhaps it's the best word, about a lot of children and the way that they experience these things and the way that they filter these sort of these sort of experiences that I think really lends itself to the idea that maybe children are more encounter prone, or if they're not more encounter prone, they are less likely to dismiss the genuinely anomalous. You know, I it sort of reminds me of uh, Nap and Corbell were on my friend Greg Bishop's show, Radio Mysterioso, and they were talking about how, you know, in regards to the Skinwalker Ranch phenomena, everywhere is sort of a mini Skinwalker Ranch. It's just, A, you might not pay attention, and B, it might not be as profound what's happening. And, you know, I, I think that uh, perhaps that's sort of what we see in the lives of, of children. Everybody experiences as much of the supernatural and the paranormal as children. We just don't interpret it as such. We're not paying as much attention. I mean, I think genuinely... There's at least one odd thing a day that happens to me, but I'm very quick to write it off. You know, I, I, I'm like, I thought I could have sworn that I put my keys over here, and then I find them in a completely different place, and I just say, well, Josh, you know, you're an airhead. That must be what it is. Sometimes, yeah, I'm sure I'm an airhead, but I wonder sometimes if, if there aren't little things like that, little shadows that we catch out of the corner of our eye, and we look, and there's nothing there, and just sort of write it off and shrug it away. Sometimes I wonder if that isn't actually more profound than we're giving it credit for. And to the mind of a child, that might be you know, just as profound as it genuinely is. And they might, you know, not have those filters set up that we, we do as we do as adults. Well, let's spin that off a little bit then and ask a similar question. Are children, for whatever reason, more prone to paranormal or supernatural abductions? Not just encounters, but are they more likely to be abducted by a paranormal or supernatural entity or experience? I, mean, I think by merit of the fact that they're sort of still half formed in the physical world, I think that might have something to do with it. If you look at both alien lore and fairy lore, it does seem that, that that's the case. There's a correlation between youth and, and the propensity to be taken to the other world. You know, at the same time, again, you have to avoid, you have to be really wary of, of how that's become a trope, this idea that, you know, children's minds are, are more malleable. You know, from a practical standpoint, if you look at, if you think these are actual physical abductions, which is in, which is a stance that I tend to lean less towards, it would make sense that children are easier to take because they're not, you know, they're not as big as, a, as, as you know, an adult human. But I, I think the real, the real answer lies in sort of the way that children's brains are developing and the, and the level of neuroplasticity that they have when they're younger. I think that that might be a better explanation for sort of the encounter prone personality and being taken or being away in that traditional, you know, very Celtic sense of being away or being in the hill. With the Fey Folk, which again, Fey Folk, I've I've come to realize, or that, that that term fairy Fey Folk is just sort of a catch-all for things like the supernatural and like the paranormal, really, than than always being you know about leprechauns and <laughs> dryads and and pixies and, and the like. So I, I think that there, there there's something developmentally going on where they are more at risk or more you know more uh, prone to being abducted. And if you look at, you know, sort of the, the science behind a lot of different things, a lot of different, uh, you know, substances, I mean, you know, alcohol consumed before the age of 18 has a profound stunting effect on neurological development. So I wonder if, you know, if, if something similar happens there, there's a vulnerability there that can be exploited by a lot of these different, these different forces. I, I, I wouldn't doubt it at the same time, you know, it, it might be <laughs> as, as we were sort of talking before the show, it might be, just psychological archetypal, you know, manifestations of, of, of a lot of just the human experience. Yeah. You know, the more that I, I guess as I get older and the more that I kind of step back and I see like how I interact with my environment and, and how things just like, it's like very basic things, Josh, like my mood for the day, how that affects my experiences and you know, what sort of things manifest because of that. It really is to me, you know, what's the old, uh, I think it's Lon Milo Duquette, 
it's all in your head, but you just don't know how big your head is. Like, I don't know. That's where I kind of come from now. It just, I don't know. It seems to make the most sense. But then again, it doesn't really make sense at all. So what the hell? Well, you know, you know I, I think I think that you're onto something there, though. I mean, because, I mean, the fact that the fact that things like meditation and like having certain dispositions can manifest themselves in at least some aspect of, of physical reality, I think does say something to the fact that, you know, like anything set and setting can have an influence upon the way that events play out. You know, you can have a very intangible phenomena that can manifest itself in very tangible effects in the world around you that are observable by others, just in terms of the way that you internalize and that you approach things with your own attitude. We're, we're flirting with philosophical concepts here <laughs> in a lot of ways. You know, you mentioned the Fae. We've kind of talked around them for a few minutes here. I want to read a quote and then get into some stuff about them. You wrote that perhaps no region's folklore has contributed more to these modern expressions of paranormal child abduction than the British Isles. Here we see a rich repetition of foundational motifs to which today's interpretations owe a direct debt of inspiration. Amidst verdant hills, weathered heaths, and imposing cliffs, children of England, Scotland, and Ireland were under near constant threat of being spirited away by the land's first inhabitants, the fairies. And this, Josh, leads into a nice primer on the fae folk and fairy abduction in your book. And I'd love to give a similar primer here. So, you know, why don't we start with the origins of fairy belief or the fairy faith, as you call it in the book, and as it later came to be known. When and where does this belief begin? I wrote that? That sounds that sounds way too good to be me. You d- um, dude, you wrote it. And uh, I thought it was a great passage. Yeah. You know, my, my, my favorite thing to do whenever I have a drink is to go back and like look through the book and be like, who, who is this person who, you know, who wrote this stuff? <laughs> so it's a bit unclear exactly, you know, even if you're not approaching this from, even if you're approaching it from purely a folkloric and, angle, where the fairies come from, it's, it's still a bit unclear. You know, part of it might have something to do with the hallowed dead. A great warrior or chieftain or something might be buried on a mountain or by a stream or by a brook and... Over time, they would be they would sort of turn into a genus loci of that particular place, almost like a spirit of the land in the minds of their people of the tribe. A lot of popular thinking nowadays is looking at them as sort of demoted pagan gods of the landscape, which again ties into that genii loci sort of concept, and then sort of pushed to the margins by Christianity. You know, it's it was quite in vogue for the first part of the 20th century to interpret them as uh, an ancestral memory of indigenous people who were driven out by invading armies. So for example, in the case of the British Isles, because again, this fairy, this fairy motif manifests itself all throughout the world, but specifically in the British Isles, it would be some, some, uh, uh, an indigenous group like the Picts who tended to be shorter, hairier, would have been afraid of iron of the invaders, the iron weapons and implements of the invaders perhaps would have, after being driven figuratively and literally underground, uh, would have uh, sought to sort of uh, sustain their own bloodline by swapping out their sickly children with the uh, children of the invaders. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite a tidy interpretation. And I think that it might be, if there is an objective paranormal reality to this, I think it might be part of the puzzle. Because at the same time, you have this you know real association between the fairies and the dead. It was not uncommon for people to see neighbors and loved ones and sometimes even, you know, all the dead of their town, all the people who had deceased and passed away in their town, it was not uncommon to see them cavorting among the fairies or in one of the fairy forts or the fairy rafts. So if that's the case, you know, if that's objectively, you know, to make an, to make an assumption here, if that's objectively what's happening, it would make sense that, you know, well, that's that's part of the answer. And yeah, I mean, it's not just an ancestral memory. It's actually the spirits of the pits doing this sort of thing. You know, that's an idea that I've kicked around a while. The Christianization of the British Isles ended up claiming that they were either angels who wouldn't take a side in the war between heaven and hell, or there were angels who were too bad for heaven and too good for hell, or that they were fallen angels who were shut out of the kingdom of God when the gates were closed during the war between heaven and hell. That's all very fine and good, but it's it's a bit sanitized for my tastes. And I say that as someone who, who you know considers himself a Christian. I think that the tidiest thing that we can do, or the, 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 the most open-minded, open-ended thing that we can do, is to suggest that they might be some not and or all of these things, <laughs> as awkward and clunky as that is. <laughs> Just thinking of, them as a, thinking of them as a stand-in for the, for the inhuman other. Because again, like I said, it was, it was very common for someone to say if something strange happened in a part of the world where there were fairy folk, to say, well, that's fairy, or that's of the fairies. When we would use that same term, you know, uh, in terms of the way we would describe anomalous events today as being paranormal or supernatural, I think it's really interesting. You can find a pretty direct parallel between 
the way there's something odd happens and people, I mean, not just, not just the ancient aliens trope, ancient aliens joke about people jumping to say, you know, aliens, like people online will actually say, you know, there was this, I don't know, a strange, someone disappeared. It must be aliens. Well, that's exactly the same way that people would treat the term fairy back in, in the, in the, uh, prior to the 20th century. They would, they would treat it in the same way. There would be sort of a catch-all explanation for anything anomalous that would happen. You know, I, I have a problem with the idea of, of an ancestral memory of indigenous people in a scholarly sense, because if you can look at people who, if, if that were the case, then, you know, settle, Americans settling the Americas should be the ones to have developed a robust fairy culture, and they didn't. Quite the opposite. It was the indigenous people of the United States who had a fairy mythology, and then, you know, the white man came in and, you know, basically you know, raped and pillaged and didn't retain any of that. So it, it doesn't, that, that, that doesn't seem to map onto the new world as, as tidily as it does the old world. What do I think they are? I don't know. You know, I, a lot of my work draws parallels between aliens and, and, and fairy folk, and I can just feel it that I'm getting, you know, the reputation as being the Giorgio Sukalos of fairies, <laughs> as being there for <laughs> fae folk, and I've, Actually, mm -hmm. what I titled my Twitter handle for a while. I don't know what the fairy folk were. I just know that what they're describing, and I, I say no because time and again, my suspicions have been proven that uh, that there is always an analog in one for the other. All I know is that whatever the direct alien contact experience is describing is what a lot of these fairy encounters were describing. And I will, you know, go toe to toe with anybody who thinks otherwise. Now, lights in the sky, structured craft, that's all a little bit different. But in terms of the bedroom intrusion scenario, the bedroom abduction that people, you know, talk about that really was popularized in the 80s and, and, and from then on, it seems to be a real one to one, one to one analog. So that's that's a big, long roundabout way of saying, I don't know. <laughs> Many things and nothing and everything perhaps yeah. were the fairies or are the fairies. Well, take us through why you think fairies, whatever they may be, if they're physical entities or ideas, why do they like to kidnap or abduct people and especially children? Well, you know, you'll find some some less reputable and more salacious uh, bits of folklore that claim that it had something to do with food or actually like harvesting blood in sort of a vampiric sense. That doesn't seem to be the case, unless you, you know, consider tales of giants and trolls, which again are sort of part of that fairy cosmology in Scandinavia. They tend to have stories about, you know, wanting to literally eat eat children and such. But um, by and large, it was for several other more practical and less nefarious reasons. Fairies would abduct people in general as as mates, as as you know, spouses, as slaves, as musicians for the dance, as laborers, all sorts of different things. In terms of children specifically, it was done for the primary reason. This is what you find most often of somehow bolstering the fairy bloodline. So in the case of changelings, which were a child substitution of the fairies, the fairies would leave behind a fairy child and take the human child. It was to sort of reinvigorate the fairy bloodline, sort of get some some extra, to, to basically find something outside of the fairy gene pool to bring in to make the fairies more robust, because in so many traditions there were a dying, sickly race. And this would sort of additionally, the, the additional dimension of leaving a fairy child behind would sort of serve a, a twofold benefit because fairy milk was not nourishing. All fairy food, which is, you know, something I talked about in Trojan Feast, was a sham. And that extended to fairy breast milk. So not only would you get a human child to be raised among the fairies to sort of end up helping to sort of boost the fairy bloodline, which, again, is a motif that you see in modern alien abduction lore all the time, you would actually have the fairy child nourished by human milk so the fairy child would also be receiving better care than it would in fairyland you know in some cases that the, that the child left behind was actually a sickly or an elderly fairy man in that case in those stories it actually uh it actually served sort of as a hospice arrangement for these fairy men to be taken care of in the twilight of their of their lives but uh by and large to put it in modern sort of ufological terms, genetic material is is the reason that that fairies would abduct uh, would abduct children. And I I believe you said in the book too that they had a preference for boys over girls. Why would they want to abduct young boys over young girls? Was there a specific reason that the gender mattered? I mean, sexism. <laughs> really, I mean, <laughs> if we just look at you know this from like the folkloric aspect that we're talking, the psychological aspect, I'm pretty sure it's sexism. 
you know, if you look at the stories of females who are taken, they were generally taken later in life. You know, uh, mothers in labor were also very vulnerable to fairy abduction. Uh, wet nurses or any, anyone who's actually literally producing milk would be desired by the fairies. So again, you have, you know, from a gender studies perspective, you have the reduction of a human female's value to the fact that they can produce milk. I honestly think that sexism has has something to do with it because if you look at the abduction experience today which again i believe is wholeheartedly is, is a reflection of this you could roughly say that the inverse is true that females are abducted more than than men are i said roughly i'm not i don't have any statistics to back that up but in terms of what i've seen that seems to be a little bit more of the case i personally wonder if it has more to do with the value in human society placed upon men as laborers and as sort of heads of household and as uh you know i mean you know to get rid of a to get rid of a daughter you had to you know post a dowry you know that sort of thing with you know men it was quite the opposite you know you having a young boy represented uh represented wealth so or represented you know income coming into the family so i suspect that that aspect of the lore really is tied more to human motivation than it is that it is fairy motivation. Having said that, you know, as, as, as you're aware, there's a giant spectrum of region-dependent phenomena or region-dependent qualities or attributes that uh, would make a young male child more or less likely to be abducted by fairies. You know, it's interesting. If you look through the literature, there are literally, I could count on one hand, the number of, of stories that talk about human female children, female children being taken away by the fairies. And I think that, you know, again, I think that represents... I think it says more about human beings than it does about fairies. The other dimension which you have to talk about is uh, the fact that developmental disabilities are more common among male children, which you cannot look at the fairy, the fairy changeling phenomena in any sort of intellectual honesty without acknowledging that a majority of the cases are describing these sick fairy children left behind. They're actually an attempt to describe developmental disabilities and conditions uh, that are really actually quite real and tragic. Yeah, and I do have some notes on that. Uh, before we get to that, though, let me ask you, you wrote that besides gender, other circumstances of birth played a significant role in determining a child's likelihood of abduction. What were some of those other birth circumstances besides gender, then? Well, you know, um, one of the ones, one of the more, more common ones, was having a fair complexion. For example, uh, it was commonly believed that the fairy folk were hairy and dark skinned and swarthy and they actually wanted to sort of mitigate that by abducting, you know, blonde haired, blue eyed <laughs> little Aryan babies. It seems like, you know, certain birthdays, uh, such as, you know, Fridays or, or certain, certain church calendar holidays like Whitsuntide, which is holiday around Pentecost would also bring bad luck being born on a Sunday or on a Thursday. Thursday was generally re uh, revered as Christ's day would actually bring good luck and sort of reduce the risk of, of being abducted. There's also, in certain countries, depending on the, on where you are, there was a prescribed time period that would make children more or less likely to be abducted. If a child sneezed for the first time, that would actually be a good sign because it represented a failed fairy abduction. Actually saying, bless you or God bless you to a child who was attractive would actually sort of reduce that risk as well. I can't deny that in some cases there seems to be a, you know, a familial genetic component in the sense that some families were just changeling prone, uh, which again points in the direction of that medical developmental disability possibility. But those are just some of some of the things. The thing that you most commonly see, which again says more about Christianity than it does about the actual any sort of objectivity of the fairy faith, is uh, whether or not a child is baptized, which has everything to do with the fact that a child who is not baptized, who is born into the human world but not born into the church is is existing in a liminal space and i'm sure that i'm sure you've talked a thousand times on this podcast about liminality so i won't bore anybody with that but uh yeah that's that that's that's the most common theme that you see and it's interesting to you know i mean prior to the introduction of christianity to the british isles you did not see you see fairy faith and fairy folklore but you don't really see the changeling motif it's almost as if it was sort of a christian import now having said that you do see analogs elsewhere in non-Christianized populations of sort of similar changeling motifs, but specifically to the British Isles, that doesn't seem to be the case. So I like to uh, spend a lot of time outdoors. I hike a lot. Where would mm -hmm. I most likely encounter the Fae out in nature? This is an inter interesting thing. There seems to be, and I've I've even thought about doing a just a book on paranormal and water and you know people i've talked to said oh that book's been done but i don't think the book's been done like it could be done 
you know, uh, Sorbonne historian Paul Le Couteau said that fairies were primarily and, you know, water was the primary fairy element. And I think it's interesting if you look at if you look at the propensity of UFOs to show up around water, that's very well documented in ufology. If you look at the appearance of Blessed Virgin Mary apparitions around springs, very common. If you look at how likely it is for a haunted house to be sitting above an underground spring, very common. It just seems that there's something there's something about water. Perhaps, you know, something as, as mundane as being electromagnetically conductive or something along those lines. I, I don't know. But, you know, any sort of any sort of water source would be a place where you'd be more likely to run into fairies. Now, of course, you know, at what point is this? Human beings are drawn towards water and there's plenty of streams and creeks and brooks in the wilderness. So at what point is it, you know, just actually us just being around water as human beings and we just happen to run into these unexplained events? I don't, I don't know. But uh, that's one thing to consider. The wilderness would be, you know, a very common place in general to run into. Anything, again, that sort of ties into that concept of liminality, the forest's edge, you know, a bridge, a crossroads. I mean, these are all sort of familiar motifs to a lot of uh, people who are into the, interested in the paranormal. Granite and boulder fields, uh, which ties in sort of the David Pilates missing 411 literature. But uh, those are places, especially in Scandinavia, that are considered the domain of, of uh, the Hulda folk, the little, the little people or the uh, hidden people, rather. And again, you can draw many comparisons have been drawn rather throughout, you know, paranormal studies and history of the the possible importance and resonance of granite and quartz and other minerals to paranormal supernatural activity. Slash, I keep on saying that now every time. Paranormal slash supernatural <laughs> activity. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's it's it, it's a constellation of things. There would be certain days of the calendar year where you'd be more likely to run into these uh, little people. Similarly, misty, rainy, and or windy, windy or blustery days are all days that would have an increased risk of uh, of running into these people. And also, you can't deny again this, this association of fairies and the dead. Um, you know, a lot of there's no shortage of burial sites in the British Isles that have a fairy connection. Similarly, I mean, you know, if we're looking at this idea of, of fairies and the dead, a lot of these fairy forts, fairy hills, fairy raths, fairy leos, a lot of these fairy sites are unambiguously human-made, and that's where people would supposedly encounter the fairy folk. If they're, you know, quite clearly of, of, of human construction, it's almost like sort of a variation on, on a haunted house. So anything that has a history of, of, of human occupation with a deep time scale would be some sort of place where you'd find the, the fairy folk. You see this reflected in, in the gen lore of uh, the Middle East, which is an absolute one-to-one correlation to fairy folklore. I mean, the, the gen inhabit ruins and old, uh, older, older sites that were, were formed in the Middle East as well. So that's sort of a sort of a shorthand, you know. I, I um, can't remember where you're located, but you know, I'm I'm here in uh, North Georgia, and uh, I constantly feel really sort of robbed of the fact that I'm not as many people who live in the British Isles are within a stone's throw of of a sacred of a you know of a sacred Neolithic or you know ancient site because that's exactly where this sort of thing uh, would tend to happen. Not that there aren't places you know in the Americas that aren't sort of weird in, in and of themselves, but the association and the ties of the landscape do not feel quite as rich as they do in that part of the world. Yeah, I am in southwest Ohio, about an hour to 90 minutes away from the Serpent Mound. So that would be, I don't know if that would qualify as a Neolithic, probably not Neolithic, but uh, it's definitely a, a highly energetic place to go visit. You know, there, there's, I, I am looking, and if anybody can point me in the direction of this, please do, because like, I, I would love to, you know, we have the Etowah Mounds here in North Georgia, and I am looking for desperately some sort of correspondence or some sort of uh, documentation of someone who came from the British Isles and looked at the Serpent Mound, looked at the Etowah Mounds, looked at, you know, <laughs> looked at some of these Native American burial mounds and said, it's a fairy hill. It's, there has to be something out there like that. And if you look at, I mean, if you look at sort of the, the, the function that these, these earthworks served in the Americas, they're very similar. I mean, in terms of time depth and in terms of, the way that they're thought of and the way that they're revered, they, they share so many similarities with these, with these sacred sites um, throughout the British Isles, these ring forts and these, these uh, earthworks in the British Isles. There is something to be written about that comparatively, and I, I, I hope to do that before I, you know, before I bow out of, of paranormalia. But if, if you or anybody else ever runs into that, you know, please point me in the direction of that, because I've, I've heard colloquially, or apocryphally rather, that uh, that there is you know sort of an, an, an enhanced amount of anomalies that occur around 
uh, these, you know, earthworks in the Americas. And I would love to find out more about that and see if there's not some sort of connective thematic connection between that and a lot of these sites in the old world. Yeah, that sounds like a pretty uh, worthwhile endeavor. So I'll keep my eyes and ears peeled for that. Hopefully the listeners will as well. And, you know, Josh, you mentioned water earlier. Water always fascinates me. So it's no surprise that one of the potential abduction methods of fairies does involve water or storms or whirlwinds, I guess, as you call them in the book. How does that work, I guess? Like, take us through the actual, like, are fairies flying with the aid of wind and and storm patterns? Or, I mean, like, how are they using these things to abduct children here? That's a great question. Like, in in terms of, so, let's back this up. You know, a lot of people, it's probably a little bit late to to introduce this concept of the conversation, but uh, the sort of winged fairy image is very much a late 18th century children's book sort of concept. Prior to that, fairies were rarely depicted or believed as having sort of wings. But that is a direct reference to the fact that they did believe to be ha- – to have uh, – they, they were believed, rather, to have the power of levitation. Not necessarily flight. And with the Welsh till with Teg, you get that a little bit, the power of flight. But more specifically, the power of levitation. And in that sense, any sort of storm or a whirlwind or you know dust whirl would be viewed uh, with suspicion. If you look at a lot of classical mythology – storms, snowstorms, any sort of major meteorological event like that was generally considered to be a portal and or means of conveyance uh, to the other world, to or from the other world. And this is, you know, completely tied into the reason that there was this association with with the fairy folk coming to to abduct children. And it's interesting, this idea of whirlwinds abducting children not only was you know seen in the British Isles, but even among the Hopi, it was believed that uh, a whirlwind could cause miscarriage, which, you know, is sort of de facto in vitro, you know, child abduction. Similarly, you know, among the amongst uh, Jews and, and uh, Muslims in the Middle East, they would actually view whirlwinds with suspicion as well as being a means of which by which uh, children could be taken away. I don't know where that, that belief, if we approach this as not being, you know, an objective reality of these spirits, um, I, I don't know how you really sort of, how you sort of really explain that unless perhaps, you know, there were some children in some scenarios who were taken away by a tornado and that sort of got you know, conflated with this idea of, of children being taken away by these storms or people getting lost in storms, perhaps that's where the, the origin is. Something that I found really interesting that didn't make it into the book that I've, I've written about, but it really underscored this fairy alien connection for me, is the concept of the uh, of the of the fairy blast. So I, I mentioned earlier that I think that any sort anything that you can find in alien abduction lore can be find a parallel in fairy lore and, and vice versa, for the most part. But there are two things that were really pernicious in terms of being inexplicable from my perspective. Those were the alien hybridization program, which Basically, was the reason this, the origin for this book was sort of a, a means of me, uh, you know, sort of sorting out how that seems to mirror itself in, in fairy folklore. But the other one was the concept of the alien alien implant. This idea that alien abductees would have some sort of device placed underneath their skin as a means of monitoring human abductees amongst these extraterrestrials. And I was never really able to find an analog until doing the research for this book when I stumbled upon the concept of the fairy blast. And if you look at the word blast, it shares an etymology with blustery or blister. These are all sort of the same shared Germanic root. And it's a direct reference to this idea that fairies not only traveled on winds, but could actually hit you with a fairy blast and cause a boil or a tumor to arise on the skin. And invariably, when these were open, they would you know, contain rocks, bits of bone, detritus sticks leaves twigs bits of uh, the nail iron bits of nails basically all the all things that sound very similar to what we are told alien abductees experience when the they actually have their implants removed from their bodies so that was for me the moment when i'm like you know i've got to i've got to stop saying that these seem to be similar things like <laughs> it's it's it's, <laughs> yeah. it's a pretty obvious comparison yeah. that that a lot of people I, I'm not aware of anybody having having made that connection yet, and I was sort of I'm sort of proud. I, I hate that I didn't put that in the book and ended up as a blog post, but uh, yeah, that, that 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 to me was that was my bridge too far. That was my road to Damascus moment about this. It's like I can't deny that these have these are this, this describing the same phenomena. 
you know, and as to whether or not that's the same thing using similar methods, that might be something or, um, you know, or maybe it's maybe it is the same thing. Maybe it's uh, different things using similar methods. But uh, there is that is that is just too clear of a comparison for me. I can't I can't deny that intellectually. No, I don't think you should either. And another thing that may be in common here is where these abducted children, or I guess abductees in general, regardless of age, where they're taken. Obviously, in UFO experiences, they are taken aboard a craft, and in fairy experiences, they're taken to fairyland. Did you see any parallels between the locations that these people claim to have been taken to? Somebody that ufologists don't talk about enough who I have thought the world of is, is Eddie Bullard, who was a Indiana folklorist who really sort of got involved in ufology and wrote what was at that time sort of the seminal UFO abduction book, which was The Measure of a Mystery, was written in the 80s, which is you can still find it on interlibrary loan sometimes. It's a uh, it's it's a very informal What's that called when you have the plastic binding on the outside? You know what I'm talking about? That sort of spiral oh, bound. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, yeah, that, 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 that's what that's how it was published. It wasn't even published in a hardback form, but it was basically he did a survey and analysis of every abduction up to that point. Um, nothing has ever really been comparably. No one has ever tried to make a similar study since then, which is which is really tragic. But at the same time, uh, I really understand because this was a two volume book that you know covered not only the cases but also he tried to extract some data out of it and uh eddie bullard or you know people people talk a lot about jacques valet you know talking about the similarities between fairies and aliens but eddie bullard has done a great job in this too and bullard was one of the people who pointed out that this comparativism between the fairy folklore and the alien folklore really has a robust through line and one of those is the fact that um supposedly a lot of these fairy forts which again are circular in nature let's talk about that just like the you know the typical flying saucer motif tends to illuminate by either anomalous lights or other some other means uh at night uh, a portal will open inside this circular space into which uh you know entities will emerge or people will be brought into this other other space the other world and in both cases you can say about abductions and about Fairyland, generally seen as being illuminated by an, an indirect source of light being dim. You can find plenty of analogs to people in ufology nowadays who claim that there are underground alien bases. Well, fairies almost always lived underground. In fact, it was Catherine Briggs who said that the three means by which you could recognize if a motif was a fairy lore motif, it was short stature, the propensity for abducting children and living underground. These are all very common things. You know, fairies would poke and prod their victims, and you see that manifesting itself in some of these invasive techniques in the alien experience, all while being supervised by a taller fairy queen. Well, in a lot of these abduction experiences, you have these shorter worker greys being supervised by a taller worker grey. Where the, where the tales tend to diverge, and trust me, I found some stories of people being taken to fairyland and being taken to an oval or circular room that's that's completely, you know, in line with the... Uh, with the modern abduction experience, where these tend to diverge is when you get explanations of uh, these beautiful, lush green hills in fairyland basically looking like some sort of, you know, <laughs> Naboo from the Phantom Menace. Wow, I'm a nerd. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, you know, th these ideas that fairyland actually looks like, you know, this idealized version of, of our world. At the same time, you know, you do find parallels in some of the more uncomfortable uh, alien abduction stories where people are taken to dank, slimy, nasty, smelly uh, interiors of flying saucers. You'll find that as a comparison, especially in uh, Tales of the Midwife to the Fairies, which is a common fairy story that we could, might want to get into a few later. Um, but uh, you'll find comparisons to that, these sort of dank, stinky, dark UFO interiors do show up in fairy lore as being sort of a dank, smelly, uncomfortable, cavernous dwelling where the fairies are actually revealed to be as truly disgusting in this case, in those stories as they are. So, you know, it's it's interesting. A lot, a lot of the ways that people are taken to these fairy forts or they, they find themselves being abducted by fairies, even even that mirrors the, the abduction experience. You have people who are who find themselves being drawn for some unknown reason to a certain field or something at night. Well, that's, a, you know, those being called p being pixie led that manifests itself in the modern abduction experience all the time with people just turning down a road for no good reason. They just feel compelled to visit someplace they've never visited before. You have similar things like you know crop circles being attributed to alien activity, uh, even though that doesn't seem to be the case. There's still you know connection in pop culture there. 
which, you know, in yesteryear would have been attributed to a fairy ring, fairy activity. Similarly, livestock mutilation, blamed on fairies in the years past, blamed on UFOs today. The inability of cows to give milk. Fairies were stealing milk. Nowadays, there's a complete, robust history of UFO sightings above a farm, and the cows thereafter won't give milk. I mean, it's just it, the the the, um, the similarities really are are every time I every time I think I've haven't been blown away how by how similar these things are, I, I find something else. <laughs> it's probably the best way to put it. <laughs> so you know, I mentioned earlier that I like to pose questions back to you that you pose in the book, and I think there's one here that makes sense to pose right now. You asked in the book, what makes extraterrestrials or aliens more believable than fairies? What would your answer to that question be? (laughs) Science-y-ness. So a perceived (laughs) perceived idea that, I mean, really materialism is is the the shortest way to say that. But I I feel like I'm too commonly critical of of materialism that sort of ends up sounding like, you know, it's more like a a, a reflex reaction. But, you know, extraterrestrials sound science-y. We we know that we exist and we're attempting space travel and why wouldn't other civilizations do that? So if everything if there is no if there is nothing other to reality than what we can observe through our own five senses or through other sort of devices, then it makes sense that these would be that these would be basically humans from another planet trying to do what we're trying to do. Setting aside, you know, the assumptions of the anthropocentric assumptions about uh you know, would an extraterrestrial race have the same values that we would on in terms of exploration, in terms of, you know, those sort of things? That sort of attitude does not that sort of attitude does not do a very good idea at all of explaining the fact that th- there are all these odd things that happen in these extraterrestrial encounters you know these quote-unquote extraterrestrial encounters a- aspects that really do seem to undermine our understanding of how reality functions and the reality of telepathy you know profound synchronicities that alien abductees have if this is little green men and flying saucers none of this should happen you shouldn't be taken aboard a ufo and see a dead loved one but that happens all the time and i think that it's a i mean this is sort of diving into where i where i was critical of ufology and my ufos reframing the debate essay but um you know, it's. I, I think that ufology ignores that at its peril. Is it possible that regardless of whether these are fairies or aliens, and I know that aliens and UFOs don't necessarily mean the same thing either, so is it possible that these are just screen memories that just take the shape of the culture the experiencers or the victims have been raised in like for example i've had some childhood traumas i've been dealing with which brings with it some paranoia and maybe some as we talked about earlier some sort of psychological you know projection maybe and they don't take the shape of any sort of fairy lore i wasn't raised in an environment where that was real i guess for lack of a better term but i've seen ufos which have coincidentally been rampant in media and entertainment that I consumed growing up. So is it possible that we're just dealing with a screen memory that is sort of culturally relevant? I would say that it's almost a certainty. I mean, if you look at, you know, the the way, even just the UFO phenomena, the way that it's contextualized itself, that it's always, you know, 15 years, 20 years beyond what we're capable of. And that's been a, that's been a persistent theme since the airship wave of the early 1900s. I mean, I, I think that that, I think that that is extremely likely. I don't, you know, I talk about this in the book, but so I'm, I'm, I know you're familiar with this concept, but I'm just going to say it again for for everybody who's listening. There is uh, the reprint of Passport to Magonia, Jacques Vallée's Passport to Magonia, by the folks over the Daily Grail. It has some astounding artwork, which is the a picture of a gray alien, and uh, on the gray alien, the gray alien is holding several different masks, and one of them's, you know, a, a sort of a a Lady of the Lake style fairy, and one of them's a 1950s, uh, you know, sort of three eyed <laughs> space invader, and one of them is, um, you know, sort of a traditional demon or devilish face, and that's a great, that's a great, that's a great cover. But uh, the actual original cover uh, included the gray alien itself as being a puppet by another off scene puppeteer, you know, which is, I think, is is the most poetic description of sort of the phenomena in general. I will agree with you all day long that this takes on different guises, which I think is the reason that one of the reasons why we silo things off is because there are different guises that people experience. Um, You know, I think that a lot of these things are a shared phenomena that really pick a mask that appeals to people. 
Having said that, I think where 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 you know you and I would have to sort of hash some stuff out is you know what what does that mean if it's the shared you know is is it a shared is it a shared sort of screen psychological memory psychological representation or some sort of representation of something that's purely psychological is it some is there something that's hardwired in human beings to interpret anomalies or oddness as you know these small short creatures taking people taking children interacting with people or children. Or is there actually some sort of objective reality to it? I tend to lean towards the objective reality to it, but I don't think anybody has a good grasp on what that even means. But, you know, that's that's something that I would I would love to get your opinion on, too. I mean, in, in terms of how you fall on that, in terms of, you know, is it, you know, is, is there something to the fact that these short entities are the ones who are abducting children? Is there something about, you know, corresponding the childlike entities, atta- you know, attacking children? Is there some sort of correlation there or or what? I don't think it's all fabrication. Because the the belief in short entities taking children and living underground is is too widespread beyond amongst cultures that should have no real cross cross pollination. But just because it's widespread doesn't mean that it has an objective reality in terms of there actually being some sort of objective non human intelligence behind it. Well, I can't really account for the height, but let me read something that you wrote here. Well, actually, you quoted a, a folklore professor from Newfoundland. I want to read this quote, and then I have some thoughts. The professor said, narratives of fairy interference were used to conceal a host of deviant behavior such as extreme tardiness, premarital sexual relations, infidelity, incest, child molestation, wife battering, and sexual assault. And, you know, I guess, Josh, this is where my general skepticism of fairy abductions and UFO experiences or alien abductions comes in on this whole thing, you know. These could easily just be seen, like I said earlier, as screen memories based on your associated cultural beliefs. And you could very well be suppressing a a deep emotional trauma like that list that I just read from that quote. You know, say something like sexual abuse or and and screening that with your your fairy or alien abduction story. That, to me, just seems much more plausible as I continue to learn more about the brain and the psyche and the greater human experience. But, you know, I'm open to other explanations. And uh, I've shared this account on the show before. I'm not going to share it in full here. But, I mean, I've had a fairy-like experience or something similar uh, about 30 Christmases ago. And I can tell you off air if you want the whole thing. But And I can also point to some specific traumatic experiences as a young kid that that my memory could have very well be standing these figures in for, if that makes sense. No, that's a, that's a good point. And, you know, it, it becomes a little bit... I would be willing to just say that, yes, these are self-imposed memories to cope for people who are, for people who are suffering extreme trauma. I would be fine with, with, with just leaving it there, with the exception of the fact that a lot of indigenous belief is tied into... The fact that there's something about trauma that makes you touch the other. That seems to be the sticking point in terms of making the idea of screen memory for trauma or stand in for trauma being, you know, the open and shut sort of explanation. Because you find time and again that there are people who do exhibit I mean, it seems like trauma is the gateway for stuff like poltergeist type experiences. I mean, the, the, the number of people in my research who were taken to fairyland and came back or who uh, were taken aboard a UFO and, were, and came back or the people who uh, suffered a near death experience and came back. The number of people who had all those things happen to them and came back with a renewed spiritual interest who came back and experienced uh, sort of enhanced uh, abilities or came back and experienced a sort of poltergeist phenomena it's 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 a very it's a very strong trend so the question is is that is is that trauma have to touch the other or can it just be trauma in general is there something about can all this be sort of answered by psi phenomena and we graft on Fairies, aliens, the near near death experience, etc. Is there something about like getting that close to whatever this traumatic experience is that sort of unlocks that? You know, I I, I, I don't know. I think that implies that there's some sort of there's something objective there. But uh, in terms of it being a non human intelligence, I I think that the the jury's out. I would like to think that there is, but I at the same time was quite flattered that you mentioned that you thought of me as a. Uh, uh, skeptic, because I, I I try to think of myself as an actual skeptic as as opposed to a lot of the uh, 
the debunkers that are out there. I, I, I'm skeptical enough to say I can't. I can't say that, but I have. A, I have a gut feeling that that suggests that there is something, something, some sort of objective non-human intelligence that's that's contributing to this. But I, you know, it's in terms of in terms of being able to say what it is with certainty, or if that's actually the case. I, I can't bring myself to that. Uh, I can't bring myself there yet. Well, we could also look at the missing 411 cases, which you also touched on in the book briefly. I mean, all these disappearances at national parks. Why national parks? Who has access to that land, Josh? Like, why would hundreds of people go missing on federal land each year? I don't know. I think I like the Scooby-Doo trope here. You know, the monsters at the end are always human. <laughs> right. You know, I, I think in, in, in a lot of the research, if you look at it, it's not just national parks. It's just that the national parks gave sort of David Pilatus, who popularized this uh, phenomena, although there are plenty of antecedents for people who looked into it beforehand. David Pilatus popularized this uh, this phenomena. But, um, you know, I think that the national parks gave him a hook into looking at how genuinely anomalous this all seems. Uh, for example, the fact that there aren't any records kept. You know, I, I've actually sort of read some of Gordon's thoughts on this, and he almost views national parks, from what I can gather, as almost like a uh, spirit preserve, <laughs> like almost like a uh, you know a um, uh, sort of shark heavy zone, <laughs> a zone of a zone of heavy shark activity that's been cordoned off. You know, yeah. swim at your own risk. At least that's the interpretation that I got from a blog post of his several years ago. You know, ha- having said that, uh, I, I think that. Um, there, I, I suspect that if people spend as much time in nature as they do spending time in nature in natural parks, in other words, if we didn't live, most of us, in this urban sprawl and have to go to nas- national parks to, uh, to actually experience nature, we might, we might see similar trends in terms of just walking out your door and going into the forest. I mean, I think if you look at sort of folklore in general, that's what it's sort of hinting at. I just think that it's we have we have these giant swaths of uh, of woodland and of, of wilderness that uh, tend to attract people, and that's why that you see these clusters manifesting there. Yeah, man. Uh, I'll tell you what. If anybody is interested in getting a a nice, healthy, skeptical dose of the paranormal slash supernatural, I'd recommend any of your books to them. So, Josh, thanks for being here, man. Please do tell the people where they can find those books if they're interested. Uh, you can find links to everything at joshuacutchen.com, but uh, if you don't want to you know, suffer through my ill-maintained blog, <laughs> there's, there's some good stuff there, but it's not as, as uh, populated as I want it to be. You can just skip the middleman and just go straight to Barnes & Noble and or Amazon and search for Joshua Cutchen. Uh, you'll, my books will pop up, uh, Trojan Feast, The Brimstone Deceit, and Thieves in the Night. Uh, or if you really want to, you know, warm the cockles of my heart, uh, go to a brick and mortar retailer and ask them to order my books. That would, that's even better. Oh um, man, brick and mortar. I'm, I'm all, huh. Yeah, I'm all about I'm all about phys- I'm all about uh, doing stuff in meat space, as it were. <laughs> so, um, and that's and that's me. You can hear me uh, not as regularly as I'd like, but you know, uh, on a semi regular basis at uh, wheretotheroadgo.com, That podcast over there. Well, Josh, really enjoy chatting with you. I hope we can do it again uh, when that Bigfoot book drops, whenever that may be. Oh, you calling? I'm there. Absolutely. Awesome. All right, Joshua Cutchin, take care, man. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much. And there you have it. My thanks again to Joshua Cutchin. As I said up front, you won't find too many people like Josh in this space with the uniqueness to his research, the depth to it, and the legitimate skepticism that he brings. I admire and appreciate that, and I don't have much to add to this. I thought I made my approach to this subject pretty clear during the chat, the whole psychological approach to this, the trauma-covering screen memory approach. That's just where I'm at with it right now. It's the only explanation that my own experiences point to. But hey, ask me again next year, and my answer may be different. Who knows? Anyway, in the Patreon extension, Josh told us the story of the tailor and the changeling, which led into a discussion about changeling analogs in the alien hybrid theory and other spiritual and Fortean phenomena, chatted more about mental disorders and changelings and how those two things go together. We also dug a bit into the Sasquatch analog in connection to the fey and alien abduction motif, which brought up Josh's next book, which is going to be co-authored with Timothy Renner, some of you may know him, and it's tentatively titled Weird Bigfoot. So any cryptozoologists out there, that's going to be one to check out for sure. And then we wound up the conversation talking about the phrase fairy tale and what Josh thinks that really means, as well as some of Josh's favorite abduction anecdotes from the book. 
And a shout out to new patrons Mark and Stuart who hopefully enjoyed that extension. And you can hear this extension and all others past and future by clicking on through to patreon.com slash oldculture. Four levels of support with plenty of rewards and perks starting at just two bucks a month. And just a reminder to patrons, we have a book club discussion this weekend, Sunday, October 28th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. GMT. We're talking the novel Dracul, the official Stoker family endorsed prequel to the original Dracula story, penned by Stoker family member Dacre Stoker and his co-author, best-selling horror and thriller novelist J.D. Barker. Should be a fine chat, all things considered, and there may be more coming to this feed about that book here soon. Anyway, that's it for me this time. So until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Oh, 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 oh.